Well, hello, Facebook family. Hello, YouTube family. Joel here. I'm very excited to be on with you today. Um, I think that this is an important topic, and this topic was prompted um, by many consistent um, experiences over the last few days. I was supposed to come on here and cover this yesterday, um, but I ran out of the real estate of time <laughs> um, yesterday. So I'm excited that I got done with what I needed to do today, um, which allows me to be on here right now, which is pretty early in the day. So thanking God for this opportunity to get on here um, pretty early. Um, for those of you that are joining me, please help me out by sharing, um, sharing this live and um, I will go in here right now and make some adjustments um, because I've heard that you guys have been having trouble commenting. Um, so I got to make that public. Boom. There it is. It's done. Um, so I'm excited to be able to be on here with you today. Now, as you can see, um, the topic of our conversation today is a topic called soul traps, right? I call this one soul traps. And I call it soul traps because we often have <clears throat> difficulty dealing with people, circumstances, and just external things. And those external things the enemy often uses those external things as traps to deter us and to distract us. And basically, his goal is to have you abort mission. His goal is to have you abort the mission. As a matter of fact, many times the enemy already knows that there's something good coming around the corner for you. And he now engages your soul using external circumstances and things that are beyond your control to trip you up to have a response that would either cause you to violate God's word, right? Or even mess with you as a person, making you lose um, power, soundness of mind, and also the ability to, to love, right? And so he trips us up um, in the soul, and this is why, as much as we are spiritual beings, God has called us to pay attention to what's happening in the soul, right? There are spiritual things that work on the human because it has to work through the soul of the human. So I call this topic soul traps because we have to make sure that we're guarding our heart with all diligence, as the Word of God tells us. And that means that we're watching over our soul right so today we want to focus on the soul because the spirit realm the way the spirit realm interfaces with the human kind is that it has to come through the soul so if you're a great um at battling spiritually you would also be really good at developing your soul right and developing how you guard your heart and how you manage what's happening in your soul when you're dealing with circumstances, people, and uh, and just things in general. All right. So share the message. Um, jump in the comment section. Let me know where you where you're tuning in from. Uh, let me know where, what city, what state, what country you're tuning in from. And share, please, because this is something that I find is absolutely necessary. I was speaking with someone <clears throat> that I work with um, earlier this week, and he was telling me about some problems that he is seeing in his life and in his marriage, and it happens at this time every year. He feels depressed. He feels um, hopeless. He feels angry and bitterness and all of these things happening in his soul. And then he now responds to what he's feeling on the inside. And then it puts pressure on his relationship. So he finds himself in the same position every year at the same time with his wife because of this feeling that comes over him in the fall every single year, right? 
So obviously, um, he's dealing with a pattern, and it is a spiritual pattern, but it's affecting him where? It's affecting him in his soul. He feels depressed, he gets angry, and it's basically the same cycle every year at the, around the same time, right? And at that same time, it causes pressure on his marriage, and um, there he goes back into this cycle of backwardness and repeating the same mistakes as the year before. And so many of you might be experiencing things like that, where every year you go through a health crisis at the same time, every year you go through a mental crisis at the same time, every year you go through a financial crisis at the same time, and then what happens is you respond the same exact way to the challenge. And so today, my word to you is almost prophetic, even though I don't really flow in the prophetic like that, but it is that there's a season. God has seasons set up for everything under the sun and that you are in a season where God is presenting you great opportunities and breakthroughs, but you got to guard your soul. Once you get that word from God that he's about to do something for you, or that things are about to change, or you are about to embark on greatness, you now have to make sure that you pay attention to what is coming at your soul. How is your body responding? How's your mind responding? How, how are you responding to what is coming at your soul in a season when there's much at stake? And this is the same conversation I had to have with him because um, him and I were talking about his family and all of the blessings that he has, right? And all of the things that's pending for him in terms of blessings. But the enemy is causing him to go to a place where he is um, experiencing these soulish issues. And these issues are causing him to make sure um, to make sure that he aborts everything that um that god has in store for him and so what i'm going to talk to you guys about right now is to make sure that you do not fall prey to the issues of the soul because the issues of the soul are going to sabotage exactly what god wants you to accomplish right now and so let's talk about it, guys. And let me jump right into scripture to give you a solid foundation on what it is that God is saying. A solid foundation on what it is that God is indeed saying. I'm sorry, guys. I just want to make sure that I'm still live because I have something trying to interrupt me. Okay, we're still good. All right. So, <clears throat> the Bible says here in 3 John and 2, in 3 John and 2, the Bible tells us that, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou may prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prospers. And so God is giving us insight concerning what he wants us to focus on in terms of being able to prosper. He says, I want you to prosper. I want you to be in good health. But he didn't leave this out. He says, as your soul prospers. So God is interested not just in the spiritual aspect of your life, but he needs your soul to also prosper. Because spiritual warfare, when the spirit realm interacts or interfaces with the human being, the only place that the spirit realm does its damage is through your soul. So if your soul is not prospering, then you are, even though you're very knowledgeable, about spiritual things even though you're very strong in understanding of spiritual things 
because you are underdeveloped in your soul, you're still compromised. So balance is the key to life. If you know that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood enemies, but against spiritual wickedness and 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 uh, in high places, and I'm paraphrasing that scripture. If you know that your warfare is not a carnal warfare, right? And you understand all of that, but you don't establish or develop your soul, you're still compromised. And so you're going to rely on external things to build you up. You're going to rely on 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 always listening to something meditational to keep you afloat because you're feeling bad. And those feelings are being placed on you from the outside. They're coming from the outside in and what are they, how are they accessing you or how are they interfacing with you? They're coming through the soul. Now, what is the soul? The soul is the mind, the will, the emotion, the imagination and the intellect. The soul is the mind, the will, the emotion, the imagination, and the intellect. So today's conversation really is to help us to avoid the roller coaster lifestyle or the roller coaster mentality. And to avoid the roller coaster lifestyle or roller coaster mentality, we have to stop letting external factors dictate our peace. We have to stop letting external factors dictate our peace. We got to start stop letting external factors dictate how we feel. We have to let stop letting external factors dictate how we're going to respond to a situation. We got to stop letting external factors dictate how we're going to respond to a conversation, how we're going to respond to an offense, how we're going to respond to someone that's being inappropriate, how we're going to respond to someone dropping a challenge in our lap, how we're going to respond to the guy cutting us off in traffic and then throwing us the middle finger. We have to be mature or established in our soul to not let that put us on this roller coaster of a life. Because every day I can guarantee you one thing. You will have a conversation, you will have a circumstance, or you will have a situation that is beyond your control. You will never control someone and how they're going to re- uh, behave towards you. You're going to never stop people from cutting you off in traffic. You're going to never stop someone from saying something in a way you don't like it being said. You're going to never stop someone on your job from being manipulative. You're going to never stop your boss from being a, a narcissist. You're going to never stop a spouse from being weak or being afraid or being, uh, 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 you know, selfish or whatever it is. Whatever it is that they're assigned to do or that they're going to do based on where they are in life, they're going to do it. So, should you allow other people's freedoms to mess with your entire mood every day? And is that what God has in store for you? Is that God's instruction? If you can't control everybody and how they do what they do, then you're going to have a bad day every day. Is that God's best for you? Or what does God really say about how we um, navigate and how we govern, right? Our soul. Because once again, our soul is what's happening in our mind, what's happening with our emotion, what's happening with our imagination, and what's happening with our thought process, our intellect. And if by any chance any of those areas of your soul is left up to external things, to dictate how those areas of your life operate, my friend, my brother, my sister, you're in grave danger. You're in great trouble because eventually your soul is going to send your body in a place you don't want it to be. And so how does God speak to us about responding to the external things? 
And there's a lot of external things. There's a lot of external things. You got to be really um, a control freak to make sure all external things are in place for you to feel good. And it's never going to happen. I'm telling you right now, I'm helping you today. I'm telling you right now to set new expectations. And your new expectation should be that external factors will never be under your control. And if you live life understanding that external factor will never be fully under your control, then you would have humbled yourself. You would have humbled yourself and you would have placed now your life in the hands of God and you would now take on God's word about how to deal with what's happening on the inside of you. Because what's happening on the inside of you is 100% your responsibility. Anything outside of you, you really need to trust God about those things. Make sense? And so as much as we do need to create circumstances and situations and environments where we can maximize our peace and maximize what's happening in our space, ultimately our mentality should be that we're not going to ever be in full control of what God, of what people are going to do on the outside. Therefore, we need to focus on our soul. We need to focus on our soul, right? Here's what Romans 12 and 2 tells us. Romans 12 and 2 is a great, great piece of advice in terms of us now working on the inside of us, right? Great piece of information about working on the inside of us. And here's what it says. It says, and do not be conformed to this world. Don't be bothered about all the stuff that's going on around you. Don't be so, uh, don't pigeonhole people and expect people to do things the way you want them to do it. You know, Sherilyn and I do um, marriage and family ministry. And one of the things that we, we teach people right off the bat is that your spouse, because of their gender, they have different needs, so they're different. Because of who they are, they have a different personality types, and there's five different personality types. So right away, as you interact with the world, <coughs> you, have to, you have to know that the world is going to operate in a way that's not predictable or not the way you would do it. And so if, if, you need things to be controlled around you for you to feel good, you, you already lost the battle because people with different personalities are going to do different things that's going to annoy you. People with different needs are going to operate differently. People with deficits and brokenness in them, when you come across them, what, do you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when you come across a fallen human being and they begin to do external things that's now affecting you because you're in the same space with them. You're sharing the same traffic light with them. You're sharing the same road with them when you're driving. You're sharing the same space at the office with personality types and brokenness and all these external things that you have allowed all your life to affect your soul and how you respond. God is saying no more. I don't want you to live a roller coaster lifestyle. I want you to focus on what's going on on the inside of you. So the Bible tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now the mind is one of five components of your soul. So God is saying, take, take the attention away from the world and the external things. Take your attention and your focus and your efforts away from controlling your your children and controlling your family members and controlling your neighbor and 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 what they do when you go outside that you don't like controlling what people do when they drive controlling people on the job take your focus away from that and work on being transformed by the renewal of your mind right now you're listening to this message and this message is part of you working on transforming and renewing your mind and your approach to how external things are affecting your soul it's here's why god said that you may prove what 
is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So for us to be able to accomplish the perfect will of God in our life, we cannot allow external things to always impact our soul. Our soul is a completely detached entity from what's going on out there in the world. And it is the content and maturity and building and development and growing of your soul that's going to put you in a situation where you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're in the world, but you're salt and light in the world, even though the world is dark and messy. You are the light. You're the salt. You're the one adding flavor to the external things that used to mess with you on the inside. And we are at a place now where God is saying you got to grow up. You cannot allow every little thing outside of you to affect and impact the inside of you. Your inside is under your government. You are governing what's happening in the soul. And God is giving us tools through his scriptures to bring us to this place of maturity and growth. So Romans tells us this. But Jeremiah 17 and 9 also gives us some other insight. <clears throat> because we're dealing with a heart issue. Our heart left unattended, our soul left unattended is bad news. Here's what Jeremiah 17 and 9 says about the heart. Jeremiah 17 and 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can control it i mean who can know it the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked is what this scripture tells us so knowing or being in a position of humility knowing that the heart our heart is always going to be desperately wicked then we are now setting ourselves up to make sure we safeguard our heart that we guard our heart with all diligence as scripture tells us so the soul test that I want you to give yourself is to look at your ability in the area of love look at your ability in the area of love because this is going to be a test of the soul. What condition is my soul in? I remember, and I always tell my story, um, our story about when Sherilyn and I were struggling earlier in our marriage. You know, we've been married now um, going almost 25 years, right? And we've been together for 31 years. We've known each other for 31 years. We've been friends. But for all of those years, my soul was undernourished or underdeveloped in a way where I would respond to feelings of whether it be anger or offense or whatever spirits were trying to afflict my soul. Now remember, there's two aspects um, to your life that you got to handle. You got to handle the fact that you're not wrestling against a flesh and blood enemy whenever you're facing problems, especially problems that are very, um, problems that are patterns. You see patterns in your life of negativity. You see patterns where every year you get sick at the same time with the same thing. Every year you lose money at the same time, right? Every year around the same time, you have relationship issues in the same area of communication or whatever it is. Every year at the same time, you fall into deep depression. That's a spirit that's been monitoring you and it knows what's about to happen in your life and the patterns of your life and what God is trying to send in your life. And at that time, that spirit begins to do a work on your soul. Remember, spirits can't possess you as a believer because you are God's. You're going to heaven, but they certainly will impact your life and cause you to be fruitless in the earth and then send you back to heaven when you're done and you're going to go meet, meet Jesus but Jesus is going to ask you what have you done 
what have you done with your time? And then you're going to say, well, I was depressed every year around October, so I had to lay around. I got angry every year with my wife at, at, in December, and we fought all year, and we never resolved our issues. Um, and my boss offends me every June, and I get mad with him, and I quit. So I, I, I haven't stayed on a job, a regular job, in all these years of my life. I haven't gotten my life together because everybody around me keep doing this to me. And, and, and then, you know, my children, you know, they don't respect me. They disrespect me. And my pastor, he manipulates me and he does this. So now you're standing before God and everything you tell him is about something external that has affected your soul, causing you not to govern your own life. And I'm telling you guys, it's very subtle. You need the help of the Holy Spirit to grab you and arrest you and show you when you're allowing things from the outside to affect what's going on on the inside of you. And that's not right. It is no one's responsibility to govern your soul. It's not your neighbors. It's not your bosses. It's not your children's. It's not your pastors. It's not the guy driving next to you on the road that's drunk. It's not the broken human being that's out there that's looking to hurt you. It's not the witches and the warlocks goal to stop doing what they're doing so that you could have a good life. It is the job of every human being to get their soul from being malnourished to being strong in God, through the word of God, but with practice. You have to practice to get better at governing your soul. Your mind, your will, your emotion, your imagination, and your intellect is your soul. Those things need reps. They need reputation under pressure to make sure that you are approved, that God could trust you that you're stable-minded. People need to trust you. And leadership is about influence. We all have a sphere of influence. But when people see that the, our soul is compromised, that our soul can't handle pressure, our soul can't handle difficult conversation, our soul is lazy, our soul has, has atrophy because we have never worked on our soul. But we need someone to come with a violin and a harp to soothe us every time we feel bad. Or every time, you know, life gets tough, we need someone to come sing us a lullaby to make us feel good. You need to work on your soul. You got to work on your soul because you cannot rely on external things and people to pick you up every time something has been affecting you. And so I know I sound a little aggressive today. I know I sound a little angry today. But God put this message on my heart since yesterday morning to come drop and right out of real estate of time. But there are things that has happened through us counseling people throughout this week. Things that have happened through me talking with a buddy at, um, that I work with. And so many other experiences that keeps pointing back to the lack of development of the soul of the believer. And a lot of us also can operate in error when we lean on the spirit realm, but we're not working on our soul. The spirit realm interacts with your soul. God says, above all things, beloved, I'm crazy about you. That's why he calls you beloved. I want you to see my best. I am wildly in love with you, beloved. But above anything else, I want you to prosper. Be in good health as your soul prospers. He wants the mind, the will, the emotion, the imagination, and the intellect to be well developed. And that comes with practice. That comes with practice. And so we can't be lazy about our thinking. We can't be lazy about pushing through a bad feeling and having a difficult conversation 
we can't be lazy about communicating when we're upset because those are all things of the soul. When you see that you shut down and you pull away from people, the moment they say one thing that you didn't expect them to say, that's a soul problem. That's a soul issue. And even though you're not wrestling against a flesh and blood enemy, right? You're, you're, and you know this, but because you haven't developed the soul, the enemy is still affecting your soul because the enemy is sending a spirit of offense to the soul. The soul that's underdeveloped, it's allowing offense to come in and get you. The soul that's underdeveloped is allowing manipulation, right? Or bullying to come upon you because it makes you feel like because my soul or my inside can't handle this pressure, I need to control everything around me to get back what I'm feeling like I'm losing. And that ain't right. Because these people are going to exist doing wrong. These drivers are going to be on the road cutting you off. These people are, are going to be on the job manipulating you. And because you're not omnipresent, my friend, and because you're not the all-knowing sovereign God, you're going to be stressed of the yin-yang, trying to control all these external things that God never asked you to try and control. But he asked you to develop your soul so that your soul could prosper, you could be in good health, and your entire life could prosper. But we have leaned on these crutches because of lack of self-control, and it caused us to be bullies. It caused us to be manipulators. It caused us to be everything but a loving person. You know what you should be able to do? You should be able to love all these people out there. You should be able to wave the guy off in traffic that just throw you the middle finger. You know why? Because he has no effect on your life. He was sent by the devil to do his job. And it is not your goal to run him down with your car, cut him off, right? Cause an accident, destroy the life of everybody else that's on the road, knock down people, innocent children, all because you don't have control of your soul. You want to bully and manipulate external people, factors, and things to make you feel better. And this has been a problem, even for the believer, because the believer is lopsided. You believe in spiritual things, but you don't believe in governing your soul. Meanwhile, spirits interact. Where? In your soul. They deal with your mind. You know what the spirit of depression de deals with? It deals with your will and your emotion and your imagination, and your thinking. That's your soul. So God is saying, if you neglect your soul and you read this Bible and no spiritual laws, these spirits are still whooping you. Because when they come and put that pressure on your soul, you're undernourished. You're not ready. He's not ready. <laughs> and you got to be ready, family. You got to work on your soul. And so I'm, 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 I'm hitting on this because I don't think that we value the soul. God does. And God don't trust us with his great work if he see underdeveloped soul. Because underdeveloped souls are destructive. They're destructive to relationships. They're destructive to the development of others around them. They're destructive all around the, uh, the board. Absolutely. Yeah, someone just said road rage. Or Marlene. Hey, Marlene. She said road rage. Road rage is, is, is a, has a direct connection to the soul of the human being. That, that human being is a control freak. And they just can't let that person go. And now they're locked in and they have to change external circumstances before they think they're going to feel better. The problem is you're still going to feel bad. The problem is you're still going to feel insecure. The problem is you're still going to feel not worthy, not good enough, and feel like life is just beating you up and it's just you're a victim and it, woe is me. That woe is me feeling that causes you to want to fix everybody and fix everything around you is a factor of the soul. And when your soul is right, you're good.
there's an old hymn that says, it is well with my soul. And I used to wonder why these old people in here singing about it is well, it is well with my soul. And it seemed like nothing bothered these old people. Poverty was on them. Um, all types of affliction was coming their way. But they seemed to have a joy, a shalom peace in them. And that shalom peace means that there's nothing missing on the inside and there's nothing broken on the inside of them. So they could throw their hands up in church and say, It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. And if you know that hymn, it talks about when life billows roll and when all of these things from the outside is beating them down, they are not moved because it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. I never understood that until recently as I'm turning into that new old guy, right? <laughs> That life is too short to be letting external things trip you up because your soul has not been a focus of your attention. So, God has given us the ability to do a soul test. And he does it through his word in our ability to love. God wants you to see, are you able to love? Are you able to love? Here's what John 4 and 16, I'm sorry, 1 John 4 and 16 says this. It says, so we have come to know and to believe that, uh, believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in in love abides in God and God abides in him. So the way you know that God is abiding in you is that you have the ability to love. And the ability to love is executed by the department of your soul. I'm going to say that again. Your ability to love is executed by the department of your soul. That area of your life is where you're able to execute, right? God's ordinance to love. And we're going to get into what that looks like. And I'm going to just talk you through what it don't or shouldn't look like. <clears throat> right? First Corinthians, and we've been talking about this scripture in almost every topic we cover. Because love is such an important part of being able to govern your life and live a good life. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 8. Here's what it says. It says love is patient. Remember, to love, you have to be able to execute this love through your soul. You got to use your mind, your will, your emotions, your imagination, and your intellect. This is the area that is necessary to be intact for you to love. Think about Hitler. Think about school shooters. Think about pedophiles. Think about rapists, murderers. These are people that you would look at them when you hear the news and you would say they have no love in them. They have no love in them. How could they do such a thing? Oh my gosh. I desp How despicable. Well, guess what's affected? Guess what's broken? Guess what they didn't manage that put them in this position? That a spirit of murder, a spirit of pedophilia, a spirit of rape, spirit of incest, all these nasty things that people do. Guess where that spirit was able to do its execution through? Their soul. That spirit had to go to the mind of that person. That spirit had to seduce their mind. That spirit has to now give them the willpower 
to get up and execute that wicked act. So because of the brokenness in the soul of this human being, he was able to go out into the, into the school with a machine gun and kill a bunch of people. Because of the brokenness of the soul of an individual, they're able to let the spirit of lust and the spirit of perversion cause them to go follow a woman in the dark, pull her into a dark alley and rape her. The soul of that human being, the, the mind, the will, the emotion, the imagination, and the intellect. Because it's compromised or corrupted like a hard drive of a computer that got a virus on it. Because that hard drive is corrupted, it now begins to do things that that person would not normally do. Yes, it was influenced by a spirit, but if the soul was developed, if the soul had the right information in it, the soul would be able to say, nope, that's wrong. Because we all get messed up thoughts all the time. Everybody listening to this had thought about sleeping with somebody they shouldn't have. Everyone listening to this had thought about killing somebody when the person pushed them over the edge. Everybody thought about cussing somebody out. And you know what? You didn't do it. You didn't cheat. You didn't kill. You didn't do it. You know why you didn't do it? Because your soul is at a place where you know this is wrong. Your soul has been developed to the point where you know I shouldn't be doing that. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we should pull down all imagination and every vain thing that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of the Word of God. Knowledge of the Word of God. Where do you store knowledge? In your mind. Where do you decipher that knowledge to make good decision? In your soul. So the Bible says, pull down these things that are trying to exalt themselves above the knowledge of the Word of God. So this thing is telling you, murder this guy, man. You know what? This guy is disrespectful. You know what? Put a knife in his chest. Well, the word of God says, thou shalt not murder. The word of God says, forgive. Your soul knows that. And your soul said, nope. I'm not going to let that evil thought exalt itself over what the word of God says not to do. So I'm going to check that thought with my soul. And I'm going to move on. And I'm going to forgive. I'm not going to keep record of wrong. So let's talk about love real quick. Because the soul executes this mandate to love. Love is patient. You're speaking with somebody. They say the wrong thing. What do you do? Do you flip off on them? Do you choke them? I used to be like that. Because my soul was corrupt. I was feeding my soul anger, violence. I used to listen to gangster reggae and gangster rap and gangster this. And you know what? I was just an angry young person. So when someone said the wrong thing to me, I wasn't patient. I wasn't loving them by being patient. I was ready to punch them. I was ready to choke them or I was ready to cuss them out and tell them, you know what? Go blah, 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 bleep, 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 your mother, this and that. That was me. So because of the undernourished soul, mind, will, emotion, imagination, intellect, because of what I was feeding myself or what I lacked, what I didn't feed myself, I was in this place of turmoil on the inside. Always uneasy, always jumpy, always easily angered, always easily offended, always in my feelings always looking to blame somebody else for my feelings. Yeah. So love, it's kind. Do you know what it's like to be kind to someone that you know is planning and plotting your demise? But yet the Bible says love is kind. It does not envy. Right? You see, <laughs> you see your spouse who's impatient with you and they're patient with people when they go out. The Bible says love is not envy. 
does not envy. Well, it's easy to say, well, look at you. you you've given them all this patience. You're so kind to everybody. And then when it comes to me, you just can't find it in your heart to be that way for me. And now the Bible says love, because love is not envious, what happens is fear comes in. Because remember, the Bible tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So if you're not loving, right? If you're not being envy, if you if you if you're not overriding that envy, then what's coming into you is fear, and then fear begins to work on the soul again, compromising the soul. Fear is the number one compromiser of your soul operating the way it should, because the Bible says when fear is there, you don't have power, love, or a sound mind. Right? It does not boast. Love don't boast. <coughs> You know, people see someone affecting them and instead of having a conversation, instead of using your soul properly and having a conversation about the issue, people try to change the narrative and tell you all about why and manipulate you. Listen, you guys were arguing about why you left the pot on the stove and the food spoiled because you didn't put it in the, in, the, in the fridge. And then that conversation goes from that specific issue to now, I always do it for you. I always do the right thing and you never do. I always clean this place and I always put the stuff away and I always this. Yeah, the Bible said love don't boast. Let's deal with this issue at hand. Don't tell me what you always do. Don't go telling people what you always do for them. Deal with the issue at hand. That's what a good, that's what a, a, a soul that's intact does. It deals with the issues before us and it doesn't go on to these vague other areas to cause confusion and, and manipulation and stir up unforgiveness and stir up all these other things. Focus, a, a, a soul that is healthy will focus on the issue at hand. A soul that's not developed will always let the devil win. We'll always give room to the devil, right? It says, love is not proud, right? Love is not proud. An underdeveloped soul will always be a prideful soul. Always be a prideful and a boastful soul. I'm not going to call this guy's name, but I grew up with a man <laughs> in my neighborhood when I was living in Guyana. <clears throat> and everyone used to call him the boast king right he was a little you know skinny guy and he always dressed really nice always about external impressing of others so he always had nice clothes and he always had a briefcase with him i was like how could you have a briefcase at eight o'clock on saturday morning dressed in the best he never left home without his briefcase never had anything important to do either and when he pulled up on you he started to boast and everything he said, it was known that he was, a, he was a chronic liar. A chronic liar and a boaster. Why? Because he didn't have real love in him. And his soul was so undernourished. His self-esteem was so low. What he was dealing with on the inside was punishing him daily that he had to do everything external to make sure everyone that knew him and saw him had this impression of him. This is a man that lived and spent his entire life. I'm friends with him on Facebook. He's still doing it to this day. He's about 70 years old. He's still doing it to this day because it's important for him to control the narrative on the outside of his life so that his inside could feel good. He still didn't get this lesson. Somebody share this lesson with him. I, I think I should. Because the inside will never be satisfied by doing all of these external things that he did. Right? And it's a, it's a sad way to live. Because when he goes home, who knows the torment? Who knows the crying? Who knows what he's feeling on the inside? But he still did not get the word of God that says that he needs to renew himself and transform himself by the renewal of his mind and then work on his soul 
God says, beloved, right? Everybody that's punishing and suffering on the inside, God's approach to you concerning your soul was beloved. Beloved. God is obsessed with you and he wants to see you no more, uh, no longer being under this punishment, this self condemning punishment that's affecting your 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 whole the, the 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 entirety of you the holistic you work on the soul he says beloved above all things i want you to prosper be in good health as your soul prospers and he says beloved because he knows how much of a punishment it is to walk around with a soul that's undernourished and underdeveloped and all your senses your whole body is firing off all types of anxiousness because your soul ain't right all right your soul ain't right so the soul test goes back to the ability to love right love is not self-seeking when we are underdeveloped in the soul, life is about us. It's always about us. <clears throat> Everything stems back to me, 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 me. The reason why I can't do this is because you made me feel this way. And I'm this and I'm that. And you're always looking out for you. But it's subtle. You can't love properly when it's always going to come back to you like something about you made you change your mind about being consistent somebody something out there did something to you and all of a sudden you're going to give up loving now again for the next four hours because something about you you didn't like because somebody or something didn't satisfy everything that you needed to be satisfied uh today it's difficult it handling disappointment for someone with an underdeveloped soul is is horrible and disappointment is something that life is always going to hand you you're going to be disappointed everybody in that that drives a car as an adult will experience a flat tire or something external Everybody that's in a relationship will experience daily offense. Daily a person saying something in a way that we wouldn't have said it. How developed is your soul to handle external things? People are going to rob you. People are going to speak behind your back. People are going to try to sabotage your children. If your soul is not developed, I'm telling you, you die from a heart attack. You can literally pass out with an underdeveloped soul because all these external things are just way too much for you. And God don't want that. This is why he approaches us and says, Beloved, beloved, I'm crazy about you, but I need you to work on your soul. Because when I prosper you, when I give you this good health, when I dump all this money on you and I give you all these things to do, all these responsibilities that is going to come with people and external things and disappointments and setbacks. When I, when I hand you all this responsibility, your soul is what's going to be able to carry you and have you experience my shalom peace at all times, right? It is not easily angered. Oh my gosh. <coughs> people can easily anger you. And it takes a mature soul to process what people have said, what they're doing, what wickedness or whatever is going on. It takes a soul, a mind, a will, an emotion, imagination, and intellect to process all of that and still respond the God way. To know that, you know what, no matter what's going on on the external, God has always and will always protect me and I don't need to jump if i don't know what to do i really don't need to respond angrily right now as a matter of fact it's better to love them be kind and go process that information you can always pick up the phone and call someone after the fact 
and deal with something that had messed with you or bothered you in the past. But you can't really go back and unsay and undo bad things that you've done in response to people's bad behavior, right? So love is not easily angered. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. Always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. This is the soul test, guys. If life is throwing you all types of issues and problems and you're able to live this situation, this scripture out in your situation with people, um, whether it be at work, relationships, even on, you know, on the road in traffic, um, children, enemies, if you're able to still live this out, it speaks to the maturity of your soul. It speaks to the maturity of your soul. So guys, I hope this um, word <clears throat> made some sense to you today. I hope that we would um, pay attention to our soul just as God wants us to prioritize the soul. It's important. He wants us to prioritize the soul. The things that are coming your way, the blessings that you're going to get, right? The Bible says that when you do things God's, God's way, God will make you rich, right? It says the blessings of the Lord make it rich and adds no sorrow. One of the ways to make sure that the blessings of the Lord makes you rich and adds no sorrow is to heed God's word. And heed God's, heed God's word in 3 John and 2. Because God is saying, I want to prosper you. I want to make you rich, but I want to add no sorrow. So he says, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper. Be in good health as your soul prospers. I want to make you rich, but I want to add no sorrow. So I add in as your soul prospers. Because if your soul prospers, then you're going to be able to avoid or mitigate the sorrows of life. Because you're, you're going to make good decisions. You're going to handle your emotions. You're going to deal with your fear. You're going to deal with the issues that come along with a blessed life. That come along with many relationships. When we're rich in relationships, we're also rich in issues and situations always coming up. Because you're dealing with people at different levels in life, people in different areas of brokenness, people with different personality types. You're dealing with a lot when you're rich in relationships. So you need your soul to prosper and you need to do a soul test. Am I able to love everybody? I was, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Sherilyn and I passed a huge event and I'm wrapping up with this at, at a park um, before I got on this live. And um, it was a, a group of people, and they had bouncy houses, and um, they had a lot going on. Computer stations set up to take pictures. They had a DJ. Um, it was a Jewish um, community there, and they're doing like a like an event for their children and whatever, some kind of community event. And I'm looking at all the pieces to the puzzle to make the event successful. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord say to me, <coughs> whenever you're doing anything big, for me, make sure that you don't let the minutia of the differences in people and personalities mess with my purpose. And this is what God is, this is why God is, is telling us to work on our soul. A lot of times we look at someone that's different from us, that has a, 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 an issue and they're doing something in a way that we wouldn't want it done or we wouldn't do it. And so we go and we start to pigeonhole the person and we now create strife in an organization. I was watching them set up and how they were working together. And I'm like, it had like 15, 20 different stations and, and probably it's going to take 25, 30 people to manage what was happening so that the community can come and have a good time. Well, guess what? People with undernourished souls in that type of environment will always cause confusion and strife 
they will see someone doing something that they wouldn't do and they go over there and make them feel bad about how they're doing it instead of keeping the big picture in mind instead of saying i don't care that she's not doing it my way i don't care that her personality is a little rash i don't care you know why she's out here putting in some work towards the bigger goal and all these people that are coming to enjoy this community event are going to benefit they ain't going to even notice that she's doing it the way I don't want it done. The point is, there are people at home that could have come and helped and they didn't, but she did. So I'm gonna appreciate her. My soul is, is wise enough, my mind, my will, and my emotion is under control enough to let her be herself, even though she ain't doing it right. And I'm going to appreciate, I'm gonna let my soul appreciate the fact that she is playing a tremendous role in contributing to this community having a great event today but people with underdeveloped souls they run around and cause discord with everybody because everybody got something about them that is not right i got a lot of little issues about me that's not right but when i work with people that have a developed mind and soul i see us doing great things because they're not busy trying to pigeonhole me to this one area of error in my life. You see what I'm saying? And then when we have a conversation about my faults and flaws, it's a mature one. It's a after the fact. Hey, bro, thanks for what you did yesterday at the event. It was great. I noticed something, though. I think it's something you could work on, you know, that might improve your ability to do blah, 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 and blah. And that's how we have mature conversations. When, we're, when our souls are developed. But people that don't have a developed soul, they're always mad. They're always irritated. They're always vexed with somebody. They stop talking to people every five minutes. And they want you to know that they're mad at you. So they, they, they walk around with an angry face so that you could know. But they won't tell you that they're mad. But they're going to show you that they're mad because they're going to avoid you. What is that? That is symptoms, all symptoms of a broken soul situation all symptoms and now you're falling to every soul trap that there is you're falling to anger you're falling to event offense you're falling to manipulation you're falling to, to to narcissism every single evil spirit that there is out there will use the broken soul to do its work it takes a healthy soul to keep evil out and even if you know of spiritual things and you know about the spirit of offense and you know about the spirit of manipulation and you know about the spirit of anger and you know about the spirit of narcissism if your soul is broken you're gonna let them use your soul that's just the way it is this is why God wants your soul to prosper this is why you you always protect your hard drive of your device. This is why every social media platform wants you to have a five authentic, authentic, authentication password. Okay, why can't I say authentic, authentication? Right? <laughs> this is why they want you to have authentic passwords and they give you four or five options of verifying that it's you. Because once you're compromised, once the soul or the hard drive is compromised, then now they say, well, it's corrupt. And what, what's, what's usually a normal function, you can't even carry out. You see what I'm saying? Even though you have knowledge, you can't execute. Even though you have knowledge, you deal with confusion. Even though you have knowledge, you're dealing with fear. Even though you have knowledge, you get tripped up. Why? Because you have not worked on your soul. Your mind, your will, your emotion, your imagination, and your intellect. How do you work on the soul? I'm going to read it again. Romans 12 and 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what 
is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So God is saying to work on establishing your soul, work on renewing your mind. Listen to messages like these. Get counseling if necessary in the beginning. Read a book about this issue, right? Subscribe to uh, channels on YouTube that are very good at mind and soul development. And then practice, right? It, it takes practicing. Anybody that I see that always fights the process of thinking through something properly is someone that's gonna remain, remain underdeveloped in the soul. You have to process stuff. You gotta practice, right? You guys see me sharing pictures, um, videos and stuff of our son. He's really good at football. He's, he's gonna be successful in that area. But what, 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 is it, what is he doing right now? Guess where he is at? Practice. School finished and he gotta practice five days a week. He's been playing football for six years. He's been practicing five, years, five days a week during football season. And in his off season, guess what he's doing more of? Training. So to be good at something, to be developed in any area, you have to practice. So read, listen, get counseling, but practice. The Bible tells us this is how you beat the devil at his game. You submit to God, you resist the devil, and he's going to go. How do you do that with your soul? You submit to God, you submit to what God says. God says, hey, renew your mind. So now you're going to renew your mind by reading. That's, that's how you submit to God. I just read you the scripture in Romans. It said, uh, don't be conformed, or don't, don't just remain accepting what the outside world is saying but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So submitting to God says, I'm going to listen to what Joel just said from Romans 2 and 12, and I'm going to go read a book. I'm going to go listen to a message. Now he says, submit to God. So you're reading, you're getting the information. Then he says, resist the devil. This means practice. You're talking to someone. They say the wrong thing that trigger you on the inside. Now you're gonna practice all this information you've been given. You're going to be patient. You're going to take a deep breath, and then you're going to be patient. You're going to say, no, that's not what I meant. Um, I heard what you said, but what do you mean by that? Right? You're not going to flip out now and start getting angry. You're going to say, what do you mean by that? Because you, you know what you're doing? You're practicing. You're retraining the soul. Oh, that's what you meant. Okay, I see what you're saying. I heard you say such and such, and I thought you meant something else. And you know what? Quite honestly, I was about to be like, yo, you, you know, don't, don't take me off right now. But now I understand what you're saying. Okay, cool. You see, love gives you the ability to back away from the situation and the intensity of the situation so that you can gather more information, so that you can process what you're hearing, <clears throat> so that you can get understanding and you can resolve the issue. That's what a mature soul does right so you read you practice and through your practice you're resisting the enemy you're resisting the temptation to get angry you're resisting the temptation to flip out you're resisting the temptation to to cuss you're resisting the temptation to go use drugs or whatever it is that you would do when you get angry and when you get pushed over the edge because your soul is now beginning to mature and build muscles and begin to, to prosper, as God says in his word. So today, I hope this word makes sense to you guys. I love you, but I can't even love you as much as God does. And this is why he's sending these messages, these timely word in season to get you to the next phase of your life. And so to now, to, um, right now, I just want to pray um, with you and pray for you so that God would give you the grace um, to be able to execute everything that you've learned today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you right now for this message. We thank you, Lord God, that you care for us so much. As a matter of fact, you told us in your word, you called us beloved, and you said, above all things, in 3 John and 2, you wish that we prosper. 
and be in good health as our soul prospers. And so we thank you, Father, for caring for us. You, As a matter of fact, you said in your word that you sent us your word to heal us and to deliver us from our own destruction. And so, Father, as we now work on our soul, as we work on our mind, our will, our emotion, our imagination, and our intellect, we thank you, Lord God, for the grace that that you've given us through your, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to be able to execute these things. As a matter of fact, Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is our helper, that in our weaknesses, that you, you are made strong, oh Lord God, because we're depending on your Spirit. Father, by your Spirit, lead us into all truth. By your Spirit, bring to remembrance everything that you have already spoken to us through your Word. By your Spirit, oh Lord God, comfort us in those moments when we need comforting. By your Spirit, oh Lord God, teach us and guide us. By your Spirit, oh Lord God, prompt us when necessary so that we would be able to navigate this complex and challenging life that we live. And so, Father, thank you for helping us develop our soul. Thank you, O oh Lord God, for helping us to transform and renew our mind. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace that assists us and allows us, O oh Lord God, to execute and practice and put into practice what we have learned. Lord God, we thank you for your shalom peace which means that there's nothing missing and nothing broken on the inside of us. Though things are falling apart on the external, though people are doing manipulating things and, and people are, are being evil on the outside or people make mistakes or people say the wrong things, Father, we do not, Father, focus on external things, but because, Father, our soul is developed, we are able, oh Lord God, to love. We're able to be patient. We're able to be kind. We're able to not keep record of wrong. We're able to, to not envy or be boastful. We're able to not be easily angered. We're able to hope. We're able to rejoice with the truth. We're able to persevere. We're able to love, oh Lord God, because love is a function of my inside, not what's going on on the outside of me. Love is a function of my soul being well. And so as the old hymn says, it is well, it is well with my soul. And so Father, I thank you right now that you are healing and mending up the hearts of those that are broken right now. And you right now, O oh Lord God, are giving them the grace by your spirit to grow in the area of their soul. Father, we bless you. Father, we thank you. We pray now the full armor of God over these, your people, so that they would be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy in these evil days. We also thank you, Lord God, for your angels that are encamped round and about all of us, bearing us up, lest we dash our foot against a stone. Father, we bless you and we glorify you and we honor you for this word and for your word that you have sent us to heal us and deliver us from all of our own destruction. And so, Father, we submit to you today. And we resist the enemy, knowing that he must flee. We give you glory, honor, and praise for all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. I love you guys. Go ahead and let's practice this. Let's put this thing into practice and let's change our life. The enemy wants us to sabotage what God is sending for us in this season by having our soul move towards offense, anger, depression, bitterness, and whatever. Don't let the external mess with what's going on in your life in this season. God bless you. I love you. Have a good day.